thank you all. You guys are doing great today. I had an announcement that was just masks, exclamation point, but you guys are all killing it, so that's great. Um, just as a reminder, I just want to be clear on the fact that we don't, ha you guys don't have volunteer education or general membership meetings this year. Remember that all starts in 2022. So, what? I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, do it. Get so, it so I've been putting in these hours. Yes, and that's extremely helpful for us because oh, we use is. all of those hours. Okay. But don't feel like, oh my God, I've got to get my uh, uh, others. Okay. That's but I'm supposed to be doing. That. You're supposed to be doing okay. that. It's um. So a bit of a theory on hours. Um, hours are extremely helpful for us because that's what we report up to the state and what the state ultimately reports to the federal government. And so it's extremely helpful in justifying our programming. It's like how we are able to do this is by you guys reporting your hours. You know, it's everybody likes a bean to count. Um, so it's very helpful, but for actual requirements for our program oh, okay. next year, just so you know that. One uh, more question. So if we do something, like I went to the prop team, you do want us to put those hours in, although they don't count towards next year. Or we don't yeah, have it's like they year. count towards like all of our hours, but, but they're not. Still want them in there. Yeah, they're not towards your requirements. Right. Like you are doing them out of the goodness of your heart, which we like maybe even better. Um, <laughs> so, so yes, put those yes, in. Put those in. Um, remember that we have our mingle on Sunday. If you are able to attend that, that is from three to four out at Briggs Avenue Community Garden. We'll have light snacks. Uh, Dress like you are going someplace very warm, but you still need closed-toed shoes, okay? <laughs> um, you're going someplace warm and possibly wet, so uh, you'll still be in North Carolina. Um, you put the seeds in that <laughs> And then finally, you'll get more information about this in today's email, but next week is um, in Chatham County. We'll be with Debbie Ruse learning about native um, pollinator friendly gardens. We will be doing class from nine to 11. Then we will have a short break. Please, if you would like lunch or snacks or anything like that, bring your own. Um, again, this will all be in the email, including the address. We'll have a short break and then we will have a tour of Debbie's pollinator garden. We'll wrap up around um, 1230 or one. If you need to be back by noon, it is very easy to leave basically at that 11 o'clock end of class and it's about an hour back here, so that's easy enough. Feel free to leave earlier if you need to, if you can't make the afternoon section. If you have any questions about that, please just let me know. Uh, but again, like full details will be coming this afternoon. Are there any other questions? Yeah. I may have missed it. Sorry about that, Ashley. The, the Briggs Garden <clears throat> on Sunday, uh, are there directions there, or can I find them on Google? Or Ooh, you can, but they're like so-so. I will include directions to Briggs as well in my email. Good call. The directions get you um, close to Briggs. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So next week we meet in Chatham County. We don't go here in Perth. Right, you meet in Chatham next week. We meet, I told Debbie Ruse, the person who will be teaching that class, that we'll be butts in seats by 9 a.m. Um, do plan a little bit of time for that. That's kind of a drive. We were hoping to carpool, but it doesn't really seem like the right time to be shoving people in a van. Right. So we're just gonna drive and, and meet there. Um, <clears throat> any more questions? All right, Can awesome. I go? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you'll love it. <laughs> I will someday, someday. It'll be like a way more fascinating. <laughs> so, all right, with that, I am going to turn it over to Matt Bertone. Matt is the director of the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic at NC State. You will get to know him very well on plants, pests, and pathogens. You don't know this yet, but it's like having a celebrity here today. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, our kind of celebrity. Good, good, okay. Uh, good. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Okay, great. Well, thanks for coming. And I guess uh, you said, I'm going to stay behind here and, so you can hear me. Uh, good. Just got a lot of echoes in there. Good. Okay. Um, hi. I'm uh, Matt Bertone. Like uh, Ashley said, I'm the director and the entomologist at the Plant Diseases and Insect Clinic. So today I'm going to be giving you a long talk, but hopefully there's, there's a lot of good photos in here, a lot of good information. Please um, feel free to ask me questions during the talk. Uh, you know, just stop me if you have a, you need to clarify something or whatever. But basically, it's hard to teach about insects in 
even three hours, let alone a whole semester. Each one of these groups you could talk to talk about a semester because we've got something like ten to twenty thousand species of insects and things in North Carolina. So it's uh, yeah. So I'm going to try though. Um, so we're going to go by pest, best pests and beneficials by order. So some of you may have read the uh, the handbook and know some of these orders, some of the general. Uh, basic general ID and kind of groups that are out there. So hopefully that'll give you a basis for what I'm going to be telling you about. Is it hopefully not exhausting? Definitely not exhaustive. So I can't go over every single pest. Some of these things I'm just going to go over the groups. Um, but hopefully this will give you kind of a, um, a primer for when you're out there in the gardens looking at these things. Uh, at the end of the talk I have uh, some uh, different damage types that you can use to describe if you're what you're seeing out there. Um, so, um, I'm going to start with Hemiptera, the true bugs. So these are, anybody know how these are identified or characterized, what the character is for true bugs? No. Yeah, so in, so in many in many hemiptera, like the stink bugs and this assassin bug, they have this. Uh, their wings have half leathery part and half membranous part, so that's a good way to, to identify that group of bugs. Um, the main thing is the sucking mouth parts. So these are sucking insects, um, and a super important group, of course, because just about all living things are filled with liquid. So plants, of course, have lots of sap. Humans have blood, so there are some. This is a predatory wheel bug, uh, so it jabs insects and sucks their liquids out. Uh, so it used to be the Homoptera and the Heteroptera. These are, you know, Heteroptera are things like stink bugs and squash bugs and assassin bugs, things the crunchier bugs, the ones with those half wings. Uh, Homoptera being the softer ones like aphids and scales and things like that and cicadas. Um, so, but now they're all this Hemiptera, they're all kind of based on that sucking mouth parts. And so first I'm going to go over these group, this group. This is probably one of the most important group of plant pests out there. And so this is going to be a big part of the talk, honestly. Um, and you got some of the others. Now, to get it out of the way, uh, let's talk about honeydew. So many of the sap-sucking insects uh, suck more sugars and water from the plant than they do proteins and things like that that they need. So insects have muscles like we do, they have nerves like we do things like that, and so they have to build up their bodies like we do, but this plant sap, of course, is just is like sugar water. So what they do instead of exploding, what they do is they actually filter out all those nutrients and they eject all the extra sugar water as honeydew uh, out of their rear. And here's one, a droplet coming from a, a nymph, a nymphal sharpshooter. These are actually called sharpshooters because they eject a stream of, of uh, honeydew and you can actually see it. Uh, and actually, if you're around in cicada, when the periodical cicadas were out, it will rain down honeydew from them. And it's, you know, people think it's raining, it's really just sugar water. Um, and it's really just poop from them, but, but it's all this. It's, it's, you can, you can to totally drink it, you'd be fine, I think. But, um, so these are, and, and a lot of things do drink it, you'll see. So, uh, one thing, so if you see ants going into plants, that's a good sign that there's some kind of sucking insect in there producing honeydew. Ants do not eat plants themselves. There are a few that take plant parts and grow fungi on them, but basically ants are gonna be uh, scavengers or, uh, or feed just on mostly on sugary substances, things like that. So if you see ants up in plants, they're oftentimes, you can follow them and you'll find either a colony of aphids or some mealybugs or something like that. Um, and it's not just ants, so lots of, uh, Lots of other um, insects like wasps and flies will come and drink honeydew because of course it's a nice sugar source for them. A nice, it's like a little soda fountain basically. Um, some drink them right from the ants, in fact, drink them often right from the insect. Um, and the ants will then protect these often. So they can actually, those ants can keep beneficials from killing these, stuff like that. So um, it's a good sign that you have some kind of honeydew producing insect. Now, another big issue with honeydew is when it falls onto things, there's a type of fungus called sooty mold. It's a bunch of different species of molds, but uh, this grows on the sugary substrate, so they, it really likes that. And so if you've left a car or something under a tree for a long time, you know, 
uh, it'll start to get all dingy. That's the honeydew or the you know sugary substance being eaten by a mold that's kind of on the surface. Now this is only superficial. It is not a disease of the plants. Um, it's just basically a coating. Uh, but unfortunately, it makes them look bad and it can also uh, interfere with photosynthesis. You're basically blocking the leaves. So if you see sooty molds, you can usually tell because you can scrape it off. You can see that it flakes off very easily. Um, then you know you have some kind of sugary source dropping on the plants and most often it's some kind of sucking insect. Uh, and also note that it's not always on the same plant that has the sooty mold. So if you have a tree above, for instance, tulip poplars, especially in the spring, they have a type of aphid that's specific to them. It doesn't hurt the tree, but they rain down a ton of honeydew everywhere. So do some large scales on those trees. And if you have bushes underneath, they can be completely insect free, but they're gonna get the honeydew dropped on them. So look around, treating the insects is the best way to get rid of that, the honeydew, because if there's continued source of food, the honeydew will keep um, growing. Um, and after the insects are controlled, then usually uh, you can you know, use a hose to try and spray it off. It's, it takes a while for it to weather away, but once you don't have those source of insects, it'll, it'll go away. Um, so there's a two kind of, so I'm gonna, when I go through these groups, I'll tell you which ones produce honeydew and which ones don't, uh, because a lot of them do. Okay, so the first group are one of my favorite groups, the psyllids or jumping plant lice. Um, they, they resemble tiny cicadas, but they are tiny, so they're only about a couple millimeters long or so, um, and uh, very diverse, uh, fairly host-specific. Basically, um, you know, one type, one species will feed on one genus of plant or one species of plant, something like that. So you can usually identify which one it is by the plant, if you know the plant. Um, there are several different groups and they have kind of different young, uh, how the young look and things like that. Uh, but again, look like little tiny cicadas. Somebody asked me actually, uh, a plant pathologist asked me how you identify them from, a, from an aphid. They're a little bit tougher to identify from an aphid, but they won't have the cornicles that I'll talk about with aphids. They have a different, little bit different wing venation. They have, um, basically there's not a lot. It, you just kind of know that they are a jumping plant louse versus an aphid. If you've seen an aphid, it doesn't look like this. These also have usually these simple eyes too, but again, these are very tiny insects. Uh, and they do jump, as their name suggests. So one of them is the boxwood psyllid. So this is uh, specific to boxwoods. Um, this is one of the three boxwood pests I'm going to go over today. Um, the nymphs produce these wax filaments out of the rear, and actually you'll find a lot of these bugs that I talk about produce wax. One of the reasons may be to keep the honeydew from sticking to them. One of them could be, you know, waterproofing in general and also keeping them uh, chemically, uh, you know, their smell away from, you know, from predators and things like that. But it's not exactly known why a lot of these produce waxes. Uh, the nymphs, when they feed on the new growth of the boxwood, they call it causes cupping. And so inside there is actually one of the nymphs. And so if you see new growth on boxwoods cupping up like that, just prime open and see, and you'll see these little tiny, tiny insects, basically. Um, they don't really cause a lot of damage, you know, they cause that damage, but they don't want to kill a boxwood, and they could be just pruned out and, dis and disposed of. Um, but look for them when the new growth comes out. Um, another one, this is more on the coast, where Pittosporumus is grown. This was a new one, a uh, new species to our area in 2014. I actually, um, with the help of an agent, noted, saw these in the, on the coast, and. Um, sent some specimens in. I was able to publish a paper on the new, this being new to North Carolina and South Carolina, actually new to the East Coast. It's been, it was established in California in the mid 2000s. Um, but here's the shed skin of the nymph. It has again a wax filament, and then this adult looks very similar, but it's a different group, a different species. And it causes this uh, cupping of the leaves, this uh, distortion of the leaves. There's a lot of shininess, it's from the honeydew. You'll see sooty mold, and you'll see ants, and things like that. Um, there, and there are a few pest ones around here um, on hackberries. There's a whole group of these that make galls on hackberries um, on the leaves. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones around here. You'll find them if you have hornbeams, you'll find them, but they don't do damage. A lot of them actually are there and just don't do damage. So, but a few of the species will actually cause this distortion in things. Okay, another group of, uh, of these true bugs, these homopterans, these uh, Sucking insects are white flies. So how many of you uh, have seen white flies? Okay, 
So, they are tiny white waxy insects with almost no wing venation, so their wings kind of look flat, they don't have those veins that you see in a lot of other wings. Um, several species are serious pests. Um, they have this crawler stage and then a resting pupil stage, and actually that pupil stage is what you need to be to ID them to species. So, you can see here's actually the pupae, these are both white flies, these things and that. So that's the adult that comes out of that pupa. And the pupae are really distinct, of course. The adults, many of them look just like this. And there's little slight differences between how they hold their wings, all these little tiny things, but most of them you can't just give me a white fly and tell, ask me what it is. But if you have these on the leaves, I can tell you what type it is. Um, and uh, they do, there are a few species that infest different things. Um, citrus white fly is, uh, common, is a common species, it attacks a lot of plants. Uh, typical hosts in North Carolina are going to be citrus, crape myrtle, English ivy, gardenia, green ash, privet, and persimmon. Um, the most common things I see them on are gardenia and privets. And so if you see a lot of sooty mold on these plants, if you kind of shake the bush and you see a little fluttering of all these little tiny white things, that's white flies. And you look on the other side of the leaves, and if you see this really flat disc coin-like thing uh, with these yellow lines right here, very small again, this is the base of a citrus leaf, um, but that's that's characteristic of citrus white fly. So no real features, looks like just a little flat coin on there. Um, now these do look a lot like scale insects, and I'll tell you how to uh, separate them from that, uh, from them. But um, they do produce sooty honeydew, which can lead to sooty mold. Uh, then you have a different type of white fly, the greenhouse white fly. Uh, it does attack many plants. It, um, survives outdoors during warm months, but otherwise it, it's, not, it's not around. Um, the pupae are thicker, so they rise up off the plant more, and they have this crown of hairs. To see, it's a little tough to see there, but basically they're kind of more three-dimensional, and they have this crown of CD. There's another uh, close related species that the pupae have a black stripe down it, um, and that's the banded wing white fly. They are often on beans and things like that. Um, this is on tomato leaf. You can see all these little pupae underneath. And so if the adults aren't there, you may not know, you know that you've got white flies, but if you see these little things on there. Um, these, these uh, we're gonna talk about scales in a minute, but uh, these, are going to, will be on uh, herbaceous plants too. Scales are not as often on herbaceous plants. Um, so this is on like a tomato. You won't get scales on tomatoes, for instance. Um, so there's, there's some differences. The biggest difference, it's hard to see, unfortunately, without, you know, these are only a couple millimeters long and without a microscope and things. But they've got a little special structure here. You can see it right there. On this one, you can see it right there. And it's basically, since they're sedentary, uh, it's like kind of this little tongue-like structure that lives, sits in a little uh, depression and the honeydew pour, uh, comes out of that and then they flick it with that little kind of tongue. So because they can't, they're just sitting there, if they just, the honeydew just sits there, it can get all over it and you're stuck in like syrup, it's like gross. So they can flick it away and everything so they don't have to worry about getting it all over. So this, what happens though, it gets on all these other plants around um, and you got these high populations of them. So those are white flies, um, and again, they're a common sucking insect. Uh, like I said, if you if you suspect it, shake it, shake the plant, see if some adults flutter around. Very tiny insects, only a couple millimeters long. Okay, now aphids, and there are a few groups that are kind of considered aphids. The most common are the aphids. Um, how many of you have never seen an aphid? Yeah, that's what I thought. So aphids are super common out there. Um, small, soft-bodied insects often found in groups. Uh, they're often found in groups because they often reproduce asexually, so the females will just pump out babies. They, they do produce eggs during some times of year, but very few people see them. They're usually attached to trees or places like that over the winter. But during the regular part of the season, they're just kind of pumping out babies that are already have pregnant with more babies and things like that. So that's why you get you know, huge explosions of these things very quickly. Uh, they'll have winged and wingless forms, maybe male or female, but different times of year. Some of these aphids go through different cycles where they'll have a cycle on one host that will be all asexual reproduction, then they move to a different host and reproduce sexually or they, they create winged ones. Also, in the greenhouses or places you have a high population, they know that there's too many and they'll make winged ones so they can get away and find new plants. Um, and the alternating host thing is really interesting. 
Uh, for instance, there's ones that go on poplars in the winter, and then they form galls, and then that, after that, that's formed in the spring, they leave that and they go to things like lettuce and asters. So they go from a woody host to an herbaceous host. It's really, really interesting. Most of them have these distinct uh, tailpipes. Uh, this one is a little different, but they have these, they're called uh, cornicles or siphunculi, which is one of my favorite words in science. <laughs> um, and uh, this one actually, you can see, it has the dried um, uh, residue that comes out of the, the, the liquid. And they produce alarm pheromones. So basically, when the aphids are in a group and something attacks one, they'll produce these. All the other aphids will then smell that and freak out. And they'll start moving away, or they'll drop off the plant, or things like that, because they don't all want to die. Um, so, so this is very common. Now, not all aphids have them, or not all aphids have them that are, that are very distinct. But for the most part, you're gonna, that's, that's one thing to look for. It looks like they have antennae off their, off their rear end, basically. Um, and many produce wax or galls, and also produce a lot of honeydew. So I'm not going to go over all the aphids out there, because there's so many different types. Uh, highly variable in size, color, and form. Uh, you have just typical ones. Uh, this is a goldenrod aphid. Uh, this is one of these crazy striped ones. I think these are on oaks, typically. Um, this is a imported, a non-native woolly hackberry aphid. And you can see it produces wax all over its body. Uh, this is a giant bark aphid, basically harmless to plants, but really impressive. That's on the top of an acorn, so it's, it's a huge aphid, um, big, big. Uh, and then you got some, this is just showing the winged and wingless forms of a, of a very common species. So um, that's, uh, I think, the uh, cotton melon aphid. But they're very, some of them feed on lots of things, others are very specific. Uh, for instance, uh, this is only on hackberries. But some of them are on, you know, there's the cotton melon aphid is named that because it's on everything, basically. They named it two, on two different things and they found out the same thing and they're not like, okay, well, let's just keep the both names or something. And now uh, there's some other interesting ones. These ones actually don't have the really distinct cornicles, but woolly apple aphids, uh, they are woolly, the, that's that wax. And they often form groups on places where you've pruned on rosaceous hosts, especially woody rosaceous hosts. So this is a this is a firethorn, a pyracantha, uh, but they'll get on obviously apple and other types of uh, you know things in the rose family, the, the woody ones. And uh, they often go into pruned or damaged areas, and when they feed, they create this kind of rough area in there. They, this this aphid also has a root form that you much more rarely see, even though it could be common, and that can affect these plants as well. But the aerial form, you can see this just colony of, it looks like, when you go from far away, it actually looks like it might be some kind of fungus or some kind of mold or something, but it's actually, if you get up closer, you'll see there are little tiny insects there. Uh, here's some other interesting ones. So this is the witch hazel gall aphid. So if you have witch hazels, and well, just about every year mine does have these, uh, but it'll have these kind of, looks like red chocolate chips or Hershey Kisses uh, galls on them. Those are actually loaded, if you cut them in half, they're loaded with aphids inside. And they grow, they grow this, they basically, uh, the mother will go onto the leaf when it's starting to form, it'll start to feed and this gall will grow around them and they start to um, reproduce in there. They have little holes on the other side so they can push out the honeydew because they still do create honeydew but it basically they would drown themselves if, it, if they didn't get it out. And you have things like the beach blight aphids that are specific to beach and they can be scary looking, but they're completely harmless to the tree. They, they suck a little bit of, of sap from it, but it doesn't actually hurt the tree. But all the, there'll be a huge patch of white fuzzy things twitching all over in, in unison and it looks like alien, but it's really just an aphid. And then you've got phyloxerins and adelgids, which are aphid like insects. They're very closely related. Um, phyloxerins are really common on a couple of hosts. The most common ones you'll see around are going to be galls on uh, hickories and pecans. They're often on the leaves or the petioles of the leaves. And they'll grow these, again, these galls that are in, if you cut them open, you're going to find all these aphid like insects. And this one is a fairly mature gall, and you can see it's got the winged ones that are about ready to go out and mate. And what they do again is they lay eggs on the trees and over the winter when they hatch the female will come out and when the leaves are developing they'll create this gall on it. And then you've got things like adelgids, the, there's the, the really famous hemlock woolly adelgid is a, 
is a, is a really uh, severe patch to hemlocks right now. It creates, again, all, you see all these little white fluffy things along the twigs. Uh, but we also have pine bark adelgids, uh, mostly in, in the western part of the state. Uh, but they'll be all over uh, trunks or branches of pines, uh, usually white pines. But um, they're more unsightly than anything. They won't really hurt the tree. The, adel the hemlock adelgids, though, are not native. They're really severely severe pests of, of hemlocks. But again, aphid-like insects, not exactly aphids, but, you know. Uh, actually, and, uh, and uh, phyloxerin is one of the most famous ones, the great phyloxerin. So a completely different uh, genus of phyloxerins, but it causes galls on grape leaves and it will infest the roots. It was a huge pest way back. There's, a, there's the whole famous story in entomology where uh, it was accidentally, it's native to here. It was accidentally introduced to Europe way, way back when, late 1800s, and it basically killed all the grapes. And of course, France doesn't like that. Um, so what happened is now uh, most of the grapes in France have uh, American grape root stock because they can withstand the phylloxerins. And so then the tops of them are you know, French grapes. So yeah, so they can be severe pests some of them. Um, now the host can be helpful to narrow down the ID to a point. Uh, you often need the, the uh, I need to get the specimens and the slide map and things like that to look at little tiny structures to ID them if you really need a species ID. But typically most of these are controlled very, very similarly. You know, they're, they're, you know, unless they're garden in a gall, guarded in a gall or something like that, if they're out on a plant, they can be used. There's certain, certain techniques that can be used. Okay, so um, let's talk about scales of mealybugs. Now, these are really cool insects, I think, because they're so weird and kind of strange. And this is a huge, really important group of plant feeding insects. Um, so they're small bugs, many lack the obvious features of typical insects. In fact, you know, there's a little insect under the shell that is, you would not think is an insect. Uh, you would also not think that uh, these are both the same species, but a male and a female. So uh, the females are sessile, they just sit around after the crawler stage. The adult females are fly-like. So here's the female, this thing, and that's the male. So he, he flies around and mates with the females that don't move once they've settled down, basically. Um, they insert their feeding styles in the plant and suck fluids. Often requires slide mounting to ID, although there's some species that are very easy to ID. Um, they may have broader or narrow host ranges depending on what species. So um, the males are sometimes extremely abundant. You'll often see these before you see the females sometimes. Um, and those are just the cocoons of the males. Um, and so both, all, both these are developing males. And again, this fly-like male will pop out of that. Um, and they don't feed, but they may be a sign that females are around. Okay, so one of the more primitive type of scales is called the cotton cushion scale. It's not native, but it's been here since the late 1800s. Uh, it was one of the first major pests to be imported uh, accidentally, and then also biological control programs were imported, you know, imported uh, wasps and beetles and flies to, to kill them. Uh, it hasn't been completely successful because, of course, it's now everywhere in the U.S., but we do have the beetles, the Vidalia beetles, which I'll show you later on, which are imported. Uh, can't tolerate cold winters, but can be found in much of eastern North Carolina. You can find them around here uh, on different plants. Fairly large, four or five millimeters, so over a quarter of an inch, and when the insect produces this white uh, egg sac, so that's the rear of the insect, and you can see this little line is where it's starting to produce that wax. It kind of lifts it up and then it lays the eggs in there. Um, they can get to about, you know, almost half an inch long or so, you know, from three, uh, two, uh, third of an inch long or so. Well-developed legs and antennae, many of the scales that we'll talk about in a minute are, have basically no legs or antennae. Um, like I said, the female produces a large egg sac. They feed on a variety of plants. The ones I've seen them on are Nandina, Pitosporum, and Fatsia, and things like that. But I've seen, you can see them on all different types of plants. They're just not super, super common, uh, but you, you can find them. And they're, they're one of the most interesting things about them is they're the only truly hermaphroditic insect. So there's some insects that reproduce without males, but they're just clonal and things like that. This actually, they keep their grandfathers or whatever, I forget what the whole thing is, like DNA, and then they can, they mostly produce females, but they'll produce males every once in a while, the males of these weird fly-like insects. I was just gonna say, 
I did not do the word. Uh, these are homophobic, is that what you said? It's a hermaphroditic. Okay. So they have both male and female, like genitalia in them or whatever. So, but many of the scales, some scales and some aphids, you know, they reproduce just, but they're actually female. They're not, you know, both. So this, this is kind of one of those strange ones. Doesn't mean anything for control or for pest status or anything like that. Uh, then there's a huge group of scales called soft scales. So they're not always going to be soft. Many times they do get harder when they're mature. They do start off soft and flat, um, but as they get mature, especially the females, will blow up and get really hard and they look like these warts or bumps on plants. Um, and uh, basically, uh, if you take them off, you can tell that they're not a gall or something like that, like part of the plant, because if you pry them off, they just come right off of the plant, the bark's underneath, you'll often see a little wax and, and eggs underneath. Um, some are only present indoors or in greenhouses. There are a few of them that can't survive outdoors here, but will multiply like crazy on plants inside. Um, and they do produce large quantities of honeydew. Um, so just a couple of different ones that you might see out there. These are wax scales. They are coated. The, the actual insect is this reddish color. It bleeds red. Um, but it's all coated in this really kind of almost like hardened toothpaste. Um, there are several species, some are native and some are introduced. Um, mature females are, are larger, about the size of pea or so, if you just kind of plop the white pea on a plant. Um, I, I often see them kind of very sparse on the plant, so there'll be one here, one there, one there, not like huge colonies of them, although sometimes that does, some of the species do that, especially when it's more in certain environments. Um, let's see, wide host range, typically on woody plants though. Uh, it's difficult to ID the mature females, uh, but the, uh, from the outside, some of them are a little bit more distinct. This is probably a barnacle scale. It looks kind of like a barnacle. Uh, this one is the uh, Indian wax scale. It looks like a little wizard's hat. It's got this horn kind of on it, and so it just kind of looks like, like that. Uh, but ID, again, is not really necessary. If you know you've got wax scales, you know you have a type of soft scale. It's, there's different, the controls are fairly similar. Uh, then you have cottony scales, not to be confused with cottony cushion scales. These are much more common than cottony cushion scales. They're, they're smaller, they are a soft scale, so they're not even closely related to those cottony cushion scales. Uh, but the mature females have large waxy cotton ovisac, which is this, this uh, egg sac, basically. And it can get even longer than that. You, I've seen them where they're like that long, basically. And so basically you've got this disc-like female, this is on a hackberry leaf, but there's a really common species uh, that's on often on uh, yews and uh, camellias and hollies, and it's actually one species that's on all of these. It just feeds on a lot of different types. It's one of the most common things causing sooty mold, say, on yews and hollies and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, cottony, cottony camellia scale, that's that one. Cottony maple leaf scale is a different species, very similar though. So if you see this long white sac coming out of a, coming out of a scale on the undersides of leaves, you've got a cottony scale. Um, so yeah. Now the canium scales are very different looking. They're gonna be this shiny brown. They, they look like little, they almost look like part of the twigs. Um, there's several species. Uh, and these are hard to ID. A lot of these are hard to ID, especially if you have the mature ones, they can't be slide mounted. So you, all those structures are kind of blown up. They're, they're really just, at the end of their life, reproducing. Uh, you kind of got to catch them when they're a little softer so that you can put them on, squish them on a slide. Um, and even then, again, it's not really necessary to know the species. But these, uh, there, there's a common species on oaks and dogwoods, but there's other plants that have these types of uh, they're, they're fairly uh, the biggest, they feed on a lot of different things. Um, and uh, yeah, so these are really common. I'd say the, the, um, the oak lucanium is probably one of the most common ones. So just look on any you know, oak uh, tree that you find around, like look on the, the lower branches, you'll see these little brown warty like things. Those are gonna be soft scales. Yes? As we go, is this one in particular problematic? Are these ones we've got to know about? Organize my absorption. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. So these, I would say a lot of the insects that I talk about today are going to be present, but are not usually going to be death to the plant. There are a few of them that I'll go over. I'll tell you when they're really important because they can't kill plants. 
these, it depends. They can, they can be on plants that are more stressed, they can be more abundant on plants that are stressed, and it can then basically cause more issues and kind of push it over the edge. But it's totally normal to have some of these on an oak out there. Just look at what density is. If you start to see a lot, then that could be a sign that there's other things going on with the tree, and it could also be something that you may want to treat anyway. But mature oak trees, and many of these are native, they have coexisted for many, many you know, centuries, millennia, so they're fine with it. And, you know, oaks get a ton of insects on them, but rare, it's very rare for them to be something that will kill a mature tree, healthy tree. But this is just so you can recognize them, of course. Um, then you got this tulip tree scale. This is one of the largest, so it's you know almost you know the third of an inch long. They're very large, kind of pretty looking scales. But we often see those on tulip trees, and this is one of the major causes of sooty mold on tulip poplars and uh, and raining down honeydew. Okay, armor scales. So the soft scales are one group. The armor scales are a really important group. Basically, only found on woody plants. Um, just about, yeah, basically. Uh, largest and most common family of scales. So we have a lot of species here. After settling, the female develops this thick covering called a test. So you can actually pry that covering off. It's not like the soft scales where if you pry them off, you're basically taking the whole insect off. And these, uh, so this is, this is one of the females on an azalea twig. But actually that's one too, that's one too, that's one too. All these hidden under the bark. And some of them are on the surface. And basically, uh, what I did was just took this little shell off. They often have the skin of the nymph. The first nymph doesn't produce the shell, so the skin is left over. So it looks like many of the white ones look like a, like a, a, a sunny side up egg, because it's white, and then you got this little golden uh, uh, skin from the young. Now, one of the most important things to remember about this group is they do not produce honeydew. So if they did, they'd drown in it because there's nowhere to go. It's, and what they do is actually, they use their mouth parts. These are the mouth parts. So this is a weird group in that there's no legs, there's no antennae, well, those are the antennae. No legs, it just taps in with these mouth parts. And what it does is it actually worms around and it sucks uh, the contents out of individual cells. It doesn't tap into the sap, so it doesn't produce, so it doesn't need, get all that extra fluid. Um, and actually, for me to identify them, I have to look at the, all these little glands and weird little things to figure out what they are, depending, unless it's a really, really common or, or an obvious one. They are also, I don't know if anybody was on the program yesterday or the other day, so somebody submitted a, a, a black gum. Black gum is a very common one that gets this. There's this, this fun fungus called felt fungus that grows like a mat on twigs and branches, and that's actually not a parasite or a pathogen of the plant, it's just feeding on these armored scales. And it's only associated with armored scales. Um, so gloomy scale is one of the most important ones you need to know. If there are, if you have a maple that's not happy, you're gonna have a lot of these scales on it. And they can actually kill a maple because they just, they usually the maple stress when they have them. So very small, about two millimeter round armor scales, it basically makes the twigs look warty like very tiny warts all over, almost like uh, braille bumps kind of. But here's a bunch of them, and you see the little googly eyes, again, that's the, the nymphal skin. But if you remove one of the tests, you see the soft female, and it doesn't even look like an insect. It just looks like a bag of, bag of stuff. Um, basically, typically attack maples, maybe found on a few other things, but maples, that's the most common. So if you see lots of little black bumps giving a dingy look on a maple, gloomy scale, you know that species right away. Um, and uh, yeah, so sometimes these actually have little orange things coming out of them. That's actually a, a parasitic fungus on them. And so you'll actually notice these little orange kind of bumps on everything. So that's a good sign you have armored scales and these gloomy scales especially as well. Now, euonymus scale is one of the ones that can actually kill a plant. So if you have euonymus, uh, these Huge numbers of them will start to kill the plant and can kill, kill plants. So this is one of the few that can really do a lot of damage. Um, they're an oyster shell type. So the females, here's the males. The males basically, I say, look like a little uh, swipe of icing, cake icing. You know, they're all, most of the males, the, and these are just the, the uh, where the males develop. It's like a cocoon and then the males are gonna come out of it. Again, it's a fly-like thing. Most of the males of armor scales actually look like that on all the different plants and you'll see that in a couple of the slides. So if you see those, sometimes the thing is these brown females 
uh, match the bark and you won't notice them until you see all these males. So that's one tip. But it's, and that's on all these things. But for euonymus, they have these, uh, it's a specific scale to euonymus. Um, and it's got these oyster shell ones and you can sometimes see the males. So they can lead to the death of the plant, especially when they get huge populations like this on the leaves. Uh, my new cypress scales, these are very common on coniferous hosts like arborvitae and things like that. A lot of people blame scales when they see their arborvitae or, or leylands or things like that uh, dying uh, or overall kind of yellowing. Usually that's some kind of root or plant or disease or you know, soil issue. Uh, these scales, they would have to be super abundant and they're really common on just about every plant out there when you start looking at them. So people don't notice them, then they're, they see their, die, their, their, their tree dying, they look at it and say, oh, I got scales, it must be that. So scales and mites, they, they don't typically kill the trees. But you see, here's the male and here's the female, again, looking like a kind of a fried egg. Um, but again, an armor scale, and that's just the covering. Uh, peach scales, white peach scales are similar. Um, they, they are found typically on prunus, like uh, on cherry laurels, things like that. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all of these, but these are another armored scale. Um, T scale is probably the most, uh, most common armored scale you're going to see. So if you have camellias and you see uh, yellow spots, yellow patches on the tops of the leaves, if you flip it over, you're going to see on the same patches these little tiny, they're one of the smallest scale insects, they're only less than about a millimeter long. But they create all this white wax around and they're often large, large colonies of them. Um, so they're not likely to kill the trees or the plants, but they make them look bad, of course. So treatment might be uh, might be necessary, but they because they do cause this yellowing on the on the leaves. Very common though, um, typically found on camellia. And then Japanese maple scale is one that will kill, can kill plants. This is one of the more important ones out there. Not not native, as the name alludes to. Um, these, uh, the females actually have this whitish coating, but underneath there's this reddish, long, um, kind of, kind of like an oyster shell, but kind of a little more squiggly. Uh, but this is a really common pest on several different, it's not just on maples, it's on a lot of different woody hosts. Um, that's, that's an important one. You'll usually see lots of them, lots of populations. <clears throat> Okay, so lots of scales. I know there's a lot of scales because they're <laughs> everywhere out there. So we're moving from the armor scales to now the felt scales. So there are a few felt scales you might find out there. They do look like they are covered in this really nice fuzzy felt. So uh, there are some that are on uh, azaleas. This is one on oak. This is one on azalea. So those are the two main hosts of these. Again, not usually an issue. If you see them, there's probably something else wrong with the plant because it's more susceptible. But the one that's really important right now is the crepe myrtle bark scale. So this is a new pest in the U.S. Uh, it's only been here since 2004 in North Carolina. It came here in 2016. Uh, but basically, all up and down the bark, you'll see these white, uh, fluffy things. And they're, when you look under the scope, the ones that don't have the fluff are red and spiky. They create a lot of sooty mold. So if you see a lot of sooty mold in a crepe myrtle, it could either be aphids, crepe myrtle aphids, which can get out of control sometimes. But if you see all these white things on the bark, that's a sign you have crepe myrtle bark scale, and it's a really severe pest. Very difficult to control. By the time you see this, there's already thousands and thousands of them on your tree, um, and they're spreading. So they're around. I have a question. Yes. Why don't you tell us what we do about it? Yeah. So, I, my job is telling you about what they are and how to identify them. Uh, there's lots of good fact sheets online, and I can't get through all the insects if I tell you how to do, what to do about each of them. So basically, these are probably things like horticultural oils and things like that. You can also use even just a strong stream of water to try and get them off. You can use some other actual pesticides, but um, I don't know. And that's not my expertise, so sorry. I, should have, I usually preface my talk by saying I can tell you exactly what it is, but not what to do about it. So Don't worry, we have a talk that is what to do about it. Okay. Yes, and I work with all the specialists in the department to tell you what to do about it. So I, I can, they have, you know, they, they can't tell you what all these things are, but I can, and then we'll, we'll get you that information. But there's usually a lot of good information, but the most important thing with all the things in the garden is knowing what it is first. Because if you don't know what it is, you don't know anything else about it. You know, that's that's where we get to. That's how we can get to control. I have one question. 
Yes. Can you send your slides? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It will be. Yeah. Yeah. I'll share this. And yeah. If you don't, if you don't want to write down everything on these, I'll be sharing the slides. So. Yeah. Now I can enjoy it. Yeah. You can enjoy it. Yeah. Just a fact. So. Um, okay. Now a few mealy bugs. Now they are technically scales, but they're a little bit more mobile. Oftentimes they're more common indoors on plants. Um, and they look like these, they often have these little kind of things coming out of them, either tails or these like star-like structures. They actually have special glands where they grow the wax out of. Um, they are, uh, they're on all different types of plants, even herbaceous plants. You can find them on herbaceous plants even outdoors, but typically you find them in greenhouses and indoors. So do people usually mistake the cotton or the cushion thing for this? It, they can't see because there's so many that are covered in wax that you can maybe um, confuse them. So it's hard to tell. Basically, if you see it and it has like a star shape, it's most, it's almost certainly going to be a mealybug. With the little, with the little filaments kind of coming out the sides. That's a real classic thing about mealybugs. They may be shorter, they may be longer. This is a long tail mealybug because it obviously has those long tails. Uh, this one is a, is a large, it's called striped mealybug because it has those stripes down the back. But this produces like, it looks almost like glass-like filaments kind of out of it. But, you know, honestly, a lot of these, even just the scales in general, you know, armored scales are a little different because you can't spray a pest, a contact pesticide because they're under that covering. They're not going to, it's not going to get to them. Other things are more susceptible to stuff like that. So knowing in general what it is, but mealybugs are usually pretty distinct because they are just covered in the, all that wax and they're more mobile. They kind of crawl around a little bit more and they have that kind of star-like uh, some of them are also on the roots of plants, and a lot of ants tend to these. So if you pull up a plant in your yard, uh, you know, weed or something, and you notice all these little things on it, it could be mealybugs, could be some root aphids as well, but those are sucking insects that live underground. Okay, so now we're out of the things that don't look like insects, and we got all the rest of the stuff in the talk is kind of insect-like insects. So, uh, first thing, uh, and just to round out some of the bugs, there, there are only a few more groups of bugs. Most of those bugs are the most important. Aphids and scale insects are super common. Basically, all feel, all feed on plants and can be pests. Uh, leaf hoppers are a really common group of uh, very mobile bugs uh, that jump around. So if you're ever walking through a lawn, you see all these things flying around and jumping around. That's leaf hoppers. Um, they vary in size from these large sharp shooters that are about almost half an inch long to very small ones that are only a few millimeters long. Most of them are kind of only a few millimeters long. Um, they can hop and if you try and find one they'll often go on the other side of a leaf real quick or they'll hop or fly away so you may just see their damage and not them. Um, now to ID them they have this row of spines down their, their back leg so that's common for all leaf hoppers. And uh, species ID may be difficult, but honestly the, the control is fairly similar. Um, now they can transmit some things like bacterial scorch, uh, xylella fastidiosa, which is also called Pierce's disease in grapes. It's a bacterium that clogs the vascular system and it can cause the leaves on, we, we've got a, gotten a lot of samples in lately, when you see the leaves or the outside edge is all burned and, and brown. That's, that's probably this, and it's really hard to, to predict and, and prevent. Um, they also, right now at this time of year, uh, if, you, if any of you have mints, like mints, rosemary, oregano, uh, thyme, and it's all covered in like little white spots and all the green sucked out, that's almost certainly leaf hoppers. And there's a rosemary leaf hopper that's been imported that's super terrible. It just basically destroys all of those things. And they really like mints. Um, but they won't leave around any kind of black fecal matter or anything like that. They produce honeydew, but they don't, um, they only suck the, the liquid out of those green plants. Uh, spittle bugs, you may see these around, but um, they're really not an issue. They may look worrisome, but they create these spittle masses. This one's on a conifer, this one's on uh, another plant. And um, these, the nymphs produce the spittle mass. They don't actually spit it out, it comes out of their rear end. So. Uh, but it is very viscous, it feels like kind of soapy water, um, it's harmless, it can't, it can't hurt you. Um, they feed on xylem, so they're, they're really feeding on the water system, very low nutrients, they grow slower than most insects. Um, but the adults are leafhopper-like, but they don't have the row of spines, they actually have a crown of spines at the end of the leg. And the most common one you're going to see around here is the two-line spittlebug. 
So these are around this time of year, you see this black insect with these orange, two orange lines. Now it's funny, in the western part of the US, they have an extra, this line is lighter, so people say, why do they call them three line spittle bugs? That's an argument for another day. Um, but they do like to feed on hollies where they create this modeling pattern. So if you see holly leaf and you see it through the sun, and you see, oh, I think this is a virus, something like that, it's almost certainly these two, these two line spittle bugs. Again, harmless insects typically, the young of these actually feed in turf. Uh, but they're rarely a pest. Yeah, I've never seen one myself, the, the young, but they'll make these spittle masses at the base of the grass. Uh, plant hoppers are another group that people see a lot of. Uh, they're completely harmless to plants, but again, this is more to make you aware so that when you see them, you don't freak out and spray them and kill them, because they are fairly cute little insects. Uh, a lot of them look like leaves, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, to protect themselves. Um, and uh, the nymphs are really common and they look really interesting. So they have these wax filaments, they have kind of these crazy eyes. Um, and a lot of these, these flatted nymphs, so the ones of this one, create these white patches on twigs of plants. So you may see them and if you go up and you poke it, or you just kind of get close, it'll move away very slowly. So you know that there's an insect in there, it's not some, you know, fungi are usually not like this, but some people might think that that's a fungus growing out of the plant. Again, basically harmless to the plant unless they're in huge numbers, which I've never seen, and it's really just, yes? So a lot of these uh, different insects produce wax, and I'm just curious what they use to make wax with, or? Yeah, so they actually have special, it's part of their physiology, they're able to synthesize these wax, these chains of wax, and they use it in all different ways. In fact, um, this is really interesting. So if you can know the sharpshooters, the females produce these special little tiny microscopic dust that's like really crazy looking uh, and they, they produce the, the liquid, put it on their wings and then when they go to lay eggs they kick that off onto the eggs um, and so a lot of these things do produce that probably either chemical protection or just waterproofing or things like that uh, but yeah it's a really common thing so if you see a waxy insect a lot of times it's going to be some kind of bug like this so that's a good observation and so so here's an interesting thing, here's a holly shoot, and it's got three different nymphs. So you've got a flat plant hopper nymph, you've got this other one that's actually the baby of this one, looks very different, and then you've got a sharpshooter, which is a baby leaf hopper. And so all on that same shoot just sitting together. Okay, quickly a couple of uh, other true bugs and then we'll get out of the bugs. Uh, so plant bugs, there's a lot of these around, very huge group of insects, you know, in the world there's something like 20,000 species or whatever. Uh, you'll see kind of them on plants in general. Most of them aren't really harmful. I will say the garden flea hoppers have been out a lot this year. They feed on a lot of different garden vegetables. Uh, they create little star-like white, um, you know, they suck out the green and create a little star-like uh, damage. And they also leave fecal spots. So it looks a lot like leaf hopper damage, except they leave, leave little black fecal spots all over as well. And they look like little beetles. They look like flea beetles. That's why they're called flea hoppers. Um, but uh, if you were to look at it very close up, you'd see it has sucking mouth parts, and beetles don't have sucking mouth parts. So, um, and in this family is also Ligus linealaris, the, the tarnished plant bug, a really famous um, bug that feeds on a lot of crops and things. Yeah. So, um, if they're sucking out the leaves and stuff like that, and it leaves the mark, would that affect the photosynthesis as well? It does a little bit. Um, the plants usually are fine. They usually su survive, and then the next year's growth is fine. And everything, uh, it can though, and you know it can be unsightly. It can be you can lose flavor and things like that. And also, you don't really want, especially with these, the fecal matter and everything. It's not something you really want to eat, I guess. Um, but it's yeah. So it's it is it is kind of gonna be a little bit stressful to plant. It can year after year infestations can cause the plant to have less growth, say. So um, so definitely scout for them. This has been a big year for these bugs and for leaf hoppers uh, on lots of different. Plants. Yes. Predatory. Some of them are predatory, but yeah. most eat plants. Does that mean like eat other bugs? Or yeah. Plants? So some of them are actually um, some of them are weird. So plant bugs are really diverse. So some of them actually feed on plants and feed on other insects. They just do whatever. So there's one, the azalea plant bug, which is this red one with a blackish blue back half. Often on azaleas, it will feed on the azaleas, but mostly it's a predator of other kind of soft-bite insects. So they can be beneficial and can be pests. 
And that one, though, also has been known to bite people. So these can actually bite people, and it's very painful, much more painful than you would think. So, because they have, again, they have jabbing mouth parts, so. Lace bugs, so this is a super common group of really kinda, they make the plants look really bad. They're very pretty insects, and they're good mothers, and they're really interesting insects on their own, own part. But if you don't want them on your plants sometimes, because basically they live on the underside of the leaves, they're really messy, they leave a lot of fecal matter everywhere, they live in shed skins. But on the top sides of the plants, you get the stippling pattern from where they fed. Uh, they're very common, they're usually host specific. Uh, so, for instance, this is one, this is the Andromeda lace bug, it's only on Andromeda. This is the azalea lace bug, it's only on azaleas. Uh, this is the chrysanthemum lace bug, it's only on uh, asters. Uh, there's ones on oaks, there's ones on sycamores, um, you know, and they can be, uh, they can make a lot, of, they can make uh, the plants look really bad. Apparently they prefer when the plants are in the sun, they'll be more of an issue, but basically the leaves start to turn yellow and have all these little yellow spots over them. Flip over the plant, the leaf, and you'll find these really distinct, they look like uh, stained glass, these little insects, but they're small, they're only a few millimeters long. Yes? I have a feeling with that with azaleas. Yeah. My azaleas. Uh, when, I, when I looked at the adults and I kind of treated them as I had to, uh, there's, there's a lot of these other little brown uh, patches. Are those juveniles or something? What is that? that yeah. Because I see the winged adults, but they're very small. Yeah, so the, the young look very different. They don't have wings, they're very spiky. They can be darker colored, mm -hmm. uh, depends on the species. They also leave those fecal spots, which the, they're very hard, they're often kind of dark red to brown or black. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's going to be all that mess. They're very messy insects, but they're, they're also very pretty and, and all that stuff. So they're one of those things where they cause the plant to look terrible. Um, like I said, there's certain ways, you know, if you keep the plants really healthy, if you maybe keep them in a little bit more shade, things like that, they tend to be happier. If it's like an azalea plant out in the middle of your yard, it could be more susceptible. And actually, we've had outbreaks of lantana lace bug recently that's, uh, that can get on lantana. Um, but anyway, very host specific. Uh, kudzu bugs, um, I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna skip through some of this stuff. So kudzu bugs are around, they feed on uh, legumes, but uh, the, most, the, the worst thing is when they're a nuisance, when in the winters especially, they'll come into homes or they'll, they'll clump on trees. So they look like little olive brown ladybugs, but they're actually uh, related to stink bugs and they're a new pest, they're not native to here. Uh, but in the winter, like a lot of bugs, like stink bugs and things like that, they'll, they'll uh, go into trees and into homes. Um, but for the homeowner, they're really not an issue to the plants, um, I would say. Squash bugs are an issue. Uh, they, as the name implies, they feed on cucurbits, um, especially certain varieties. And their saliva actually causes the leaves to disintegrate, basically. They, they have toxic saliva to it. Um, they have very specific looking little golden orange eggs that are like little tiny footballs on the underside of the leaves. If you can catch them early, you can just take that whole egg mass out or those eggs out and you've gotten rid of the population. Uh, for, home, for homeowners, oftentimes if you just scout them, if you really have a small garden and some, a few uh, cucurbits, you can basically find the nymphs or the adults and kind of knock them off into some soapy water and, and you've controlled them. You don't really have to use any harsh chemicals or anything like that. Um, they can transmit some uh, diseases, but uh, these are variably found. Some years worse some than others, some more in production sometimes too. Uh, then you have stink bugs. So how many of you are familiar with stink bugs? Yeah, everybody is, yeah. So stink bugs are an interesting group uh, and all these bugs that I'm talking about recently, these the stink bugs, the, um, the uh, squash bugs, things like that, they do have scent glands that produce this odor, and that's how they protect themselves. I threw a stink bug in with a black widow once, and as soon, the black widow went to attack it, and then immediately it was like writhing around and on the ground, it just did not like it. So that's why, you know, they don't want to be attacked by black widows and stuff. Uh, so the pest stink bugs are typically generalists, feeding generalists. They'll feed on all different plants. They suck the plant juices, particularly from seeds and seed heads, but also from fruits, and so they can cause damage to fruits and seeds. Um, they can cause that deformation, um, and some are nuisance pests in homes where the adults overwinter, especially brown marmorated stink bug. So the green stink bugs, there are a bunch of different green stink bugs. Brown marmorated stink bug can be told from other close relatives because it has striped antennae. All the other brownish stink bugs around are going to have very solid colored antennae. Um, excuse me, so that's the way to tell them. 
But note that there are beneficial stink bugs. So there are stink bugs that are predatory. And a lot of these eat things like caterpillars and grasshoppers and stuff like that, although they're generalist predators. Um, so you got the Florida predatory stink bug, which is the really beautiful cobalt blue and orange, and this spine soldier bug. So again, these are, um, are uh, good guys. So. And then assassin bugs are another predatory group of, uh, of insects. They do, they can bite if you hold them accidentally, you know, so don't grab these and they'll, they'll, they can bite, uh, but they are predators. But these generalist predators, just make sure you know that and all these types of generalist predators, like praying mantises, things like that, they will eat anything. So they'll eat honeybees, but they'll also eat, you know, the caterpillars that are eating anything. So, yeah. Um, and then there's some little tiny bugs, true bugs that are predators. So these big-eyed bugs, you can tell why they're called that. Um, and these minute pirate bugs, all very small, and they are very beneficial predators of uh, other small insects like aphids and things like that. Okay, so I have a break in here, but actually I'm going to keep going for, because we're going to, yeah, unless you want to take, yeah, just stretch for a second, maybe give this like a 30 second break, because uh, Ashley has a very scheduled break for us. I thought she likes snacks in the garden. We're going to snacks in the garden. And we can look for some critters out there. I've always seen some good stuff out there. So I would definitely, when you leave today, if you look at the sweet potatoes that are in front, there's all those holes in them. I'll be talking about that group in a minute, and uh, there's some really cool things there. All right, all right, so okay, we'll get through this. All right, I'll try and get through this a little bit more quickly. So bugs are a big part. Bugs, because like I said, they suck juices, there's a lot of them on plants, they're a really big, diverse group. Okay, thrips. How many of you have ever heard of a thrips? Okay, we've got some people that know thrips. Okay, um, thrips is both singular and plural. So you see one thrips, or two thrips, or three thrips. It's, yeah, so if you say thrip, it, it hurts me. It hurts. But, uh, but that's all right, I won't, I won't be, you know, it's, it's all right, I won't, I won't kick you out or anything. But it's, uh, yeah, thrips is both singular and plural. Small and elongated insects, mostly under three millimeters. Most are plant feeders, but many feed on fungal spores and even other insects. There's some beneficial thrips out there. Often yellow, but also darker or banded ones. And they have these thin strap-like wings with a fringe of hairs on them. Um, I think the family is tough, you gotta slime out them. And some of them actually transmit viruses, like tomato spot or blue virus, which is transmitted by Franklin yellow thrips mostly. Um, so the, that's these, these common thrips are in the genus Franklin yellow. Uh, small, yellowish, I think, I honestly, I always tell people they look like little lizards almost, like little lizard insects, but again, they're so small that they just look like a little tiny yellow long dot kind of running around. Um, these can be found in high numbers uh, with the nymphs often, so this is on a cucumber, and they are very, uh, so the nymph is right here, they call them larvae, because they go through a resting stage also, and then the adult is right here with those wings. Uh, you can often tell their damage because it's patches of silvery or, or sucked out, kind of chlorotic, white, bleached out areas. And they also are very messy. They defecate a lot all over the place where they're eating. So around those patches, you're going to see all these little black or dark green flecks around it. So that's a good sign that you have thrips. Uh, a lot of times they're going to be in flowers. They don't do a lot of damage to the plant itself but in high populations, they can do a lot of damage. And this group can, can, can transmit diseases. Uh, for instance, here's the greenhouse thrips. Uh, this one leaves a lot of fecal specks everywhere, these really hard ones, and they're very kind of rough ones, but um, that's a viburnum leaf that should be green, but you can see it's completely, kind of the, the surfaces have pulled off and it's just not green anymore. Um, so thrips can cause a lot of damage, uh, they can transmit viruses. If you have tomato spot wheel virus in your, in your garden, that means you've got a thrips problem uh, because they take the virus and transfer it to different hosts. So thrips are out there, they're often more of a problem in greenhouses, uh, you know, in garden situations, unless it's a weird outbreak of something like this, you won't often see them, but again, be aware that they're out there. They also do bite sometimes. If you get into a swarm of them, they will bite. Uh, for no reason. Uh, a lot of these things do that because they want to probe and see if you're tasty or something. Okay, let's go over some Hymenoptera. So this is the, we're now into the groups of insects that undergo complete metamorphosis. So these all have a larval stage, a pupil stage, and an adult stage. 
And that's important because the adults and larvae can feed on very different things. Um, and sometimes one is the pest and sometimes the other. So there aren't a lot of huge amount of pests. In fact, Hymenoptera includes most, many of the beneficials we have because a lot of them are parasitoids of other insects. Um, but one group of Hymenoptera are the sawflies. And so the larvae are actually caterpillar-like. Uh, if you were to see this, you would think maybe that's a bunch of caterpillars, but they're going to grow up to be a wasp-like insect like this. And they are plant feeders. Uh, some of them will defoliate the plants really well. There's some that feed on pines and needles, and some that feed on uh, just regular uh, broadleaf plants. They cannot sting, though. They're a primitive wasp. But the the egg-laying device is just this thin saw-like thing that they use to saw the eggs into the plants, and then they hatch and, and do that. Various families, uh, they can defoliate. Some slug-like and skeletonized plants. I would say the most common sawfly you're going to see are the rose slug sawflies. So in the spring, you'll see these little windows in the rose leaves, or then these little uh, holes, and look around for this kind of fuzzy-looking green caterpillar-like insect. That's actually, again, going to turn into a wasp when it's older. Um, now, to tell the difference, this slide I use in just about every talk, so sawflies versus caterpillars. So Caterpillars are going to have five or fewer uh, pairs of these fleshy pro legs on the abdomen. They're not true legs. And they will almost always have crochets, which are these little tiny hooks on the tip. And you can see that on, if you flip a caterpillar over, you can see it'll either have a row of hooks or have a circle of hooks. They look like just like the little circle dots. And they also have these six stomata, which are the simple eyes. So the little crescent of all these eyes. The sawflies, though, are going to have more, six or more pairs of pro legs without hooks on them, and they have one simple eye. So it looks very cartoonish, kind of. So if you go back here, you can see each of these has just this one eye, and then if you look, it's got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pairs of pro legs. So that's really important, and when you come to control, things like BT will not work on sawflies. So we've had issues where people have an infestation, they think of caterpillars, they spray BT, BT, and then these keep going. And so this is one of the reasons why ID is really important. So know your sawflies, know your caterpillars. Sawflies are not as common as caterpillars, but they are fairly common. Do you have a question back? One eye or one eye on each side? What's that? Is that one eye? One eye on each side, yeah. They're symmetrical. Most insects are symmetrical, so yeah, yeah. Um, okay, now another group of wasps that you'll see around are going to be the gall wasps. These don't sting as well, and they live as grubs in swellings in plants, and it's almost always on oaks. So if you see oaks with these weird growths on the twigs or on the leaves, that's almost certainly going to be a gall wasp. These typically don't hurt the plants, uh, especially mature, healthy oaks. They can girdle them sometimes if you have the ones on the twigs, especially if there's a lot of them. Uh, but for the most part, they're harmless to the plants, uh, and they look kind of interesting. So you get these big fuzzy, this is the, the wool sower gall, which is this big, puffy, uh, fuzzy thing with these pink spots on it, really crazy looking. But, it's, uh, but inside there is going to be a little grubby wasp that's developing. Um, not really much else, that, but they are very noticeable. So if you see oaks with weird growths, it's almost certainly going to be a gall wasp. Then you got a lot of uh, parasitic wasps, these really tiny ones. Um, anybody know what this wasp is on? So it's a, there's a plant here, but what's this? The wasp is stinging something. What is it? Anybody know? Oh, uh, uh, scale. Yeah, it's an armored scale. So these wasps are so tiny that millimeter long or two millimeter long scale. That's how tiny that wasp is. Wow. Some of these wasps, some wasps are smaller than single-celled organisms. Wow. So they've got muscles, they've got brains, they've got everything, and they're smaller than that. This one's coming out of some squat, some leaf-footed bug eggs. So many of these parasitoids feed, uh, lay their eggs in the eggs or other insects. Uh, and they're really important for controlling other insects. There's a whole group that uh, parasitizes aphids. So you see the aphid mummies some plants. They're like a bloated, dried husk of an aphid. And if you see a little circle, that's where the, the insect has come out. So really important. Um, there's other groups that are bigger, and they saw into, they drill into wood to get their prey that's in the wood. So wood feeding, uh, eel larvae, things like that. And I'm sure everyone has seen a horn, horn worm with these white cocoons on it. That's the type of wasp that laid eggs inside of the caterpillar, and then all the babies of the wasp hatch and eat the insides. And then when the, you know, the caterpillar is still kind of alive, but they burrow their way out and they create these silk cocoons. So those are not eggs. 
there's actually the cocoons that the wasp has made after they're done feeding, and then out will pop a bunch of them. So if you see a, a hornworm like this, you can take it off the plant, but leave it in the garden, you know, leave it on the ground or something. That, that's all these are new wasps that are gonna come out and kill other hornworms. So yeah, so wasps are really important. Uh, there are a lot of solitary wasps out there, so like mud daubers, uh, orca pipe mud daubers. These groups um, are not aggressive. They can sting, but they're not aggressive. They're solitary wasps. They don't have a colony to defend. And uh, many of these are going to be filled with spiders. So both, both types of mud daubers that you'll see, the organ pipe and these black and yellow ones that create more of a, kind of something that looks like somebody threw just a mud ball on the wall. Those are going to be, if you open one up, you're going to be, they're loaded with spiders. So they hunt spiders, which is bad for the spiders. I like spiders, but I also like these wasps, so whatever. And most people don't like spiders, so I guess you like these wasps. Um, so they yeah. clone spiders to feed their larvae when they hatch. Yep, exactly. So the spiders are alive, but what, sedated? Yes, they sting them and they paralyze them, so the spider is alive, but doesn't can't do anything about it, and they then lay eggs on them, and then the larvae hatch, and they just grow, and, and they just sit there and eat all these spiders. So they don't have refrigeration. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> And there are lots of different hunting wasps, solitary hunting wasps, so uh, cicada killers are out right now, and they hunt cicadas, and cicadas are big and meaty, and so they love those, and they do the same thing. They sting them, bury them in the ground. Uh, I just gave a talk yesterday about, about these things, and some of these things actually sting the thing and let it <laughs> revive, and then it doesn't know it's got an egg on it, and then it runs back in its burrow and gets eaten. So, yeah. So they're, they're scary if you're an insect, they're not scary, they shouldn't be scary if you're a human. Uh, now, social wasps, though, they can sting, they, will, they can be aggressive sometimes, so these are going to be um, basically building paper nests above ground, so you've got uh, paper wasps that build these umbrella-like uh, nests up in eaves of homes, you've got hornets and yellow jackets, the yellow jackets nest in the ground, but they build actually a big paper nest in the ground in a cavity, and so they attain, usually the paper wasps are not as aggressive because they have smaller colonies, but hornets and yellow jackets can have hundreds, thousands of individuals, and so you can, a few of them can die by uh, protecting the colony, so they'll come out and sting no problem if you're near their nest. Yes? I read that a, a bald-faced hornet can recognize you. <laughs> now, I just, like, I've read Maybe. this, I've, I've seen this, and I was just wondering about that given that- Recognize you individually, them. or like uh, just a person? A, per a person. So okay. In other words, if you disturb their nest, yeah. uh, and then you, uh, you know, come back at another time, oh, yeah. then literally... It could be, yeah, they probably know, because they want to make sure that they fend off that, that intruder. Because their colony is full of little larvae and all these paper cells, and they are protecting their, their sisters, basically. All of them are sisters. Uh, there's usually one queen in these nests. Um, and, uh, but one of the things I will say, they are beneficial insects. So here's one of the ones where you know, you've got to know, you know, when the right time to treat. So if you have a colony somewhere, a nest out in the back of your yard or somewhere on the property and they're not bothering you, you're not near the nest, it's sometimes good to leave them because these wasps love to hunt things like caterpillars. And what they do is they chop them up. They don't eat them themselves. What they do is they bring them back to the nest and their babies can eat them. The babies have jaws and they can actually eat them. These will be attracted to then, you know, picnics because they want to chew some of your meat, bring it back to the colony and feed the babies. So. Basically, uh, if you can stand them, they're usually not as aggressive they're, when they're out patrolling because they don't have a nest to, to defend. But if you get close to a nest, of course, they will come out and sting. Um, but uh, yeah, that's social wasps. Uh, ants are just another type of social wasp, technically. Um, I'm not going to talk much about ants, actually. So actually, I'll skip this because it's to get going. But you all know what ants are. And uh, I can tell you, yeah. <laughs> So, some of them do sting, like fire ants. So it's not biting, they're stinging, because again, they're just a wasp, basically. Uh, but fire ants, of course, making mounds in disturbed habitats. Uh, you can tell fire ants, apart from other ants, though, they're fairly small. They've got a red front half, and then their abdomen is much darker brown. They also have these two nodes right here, these two little knobs before the abdomen. Those two characteristics are going to be able to tell you whether you have a fire ant. Not every red ant that's out there is a fire ant. Most of them, are, there's lots of other red ants. Uh, but anyway, they typically make these mounds and will come out very quickly and sting and stuff. So that's why they call them fire ants. Now bees are technically actually related to hunting wasps. They're actually 
evolved from those mud daubers and things like that, which is funny. But they're vegetarian, so they're vegetarian wasps out there. All of you know a lot about bees. Most bees are solitary ground nesters. Uh, all bees do collect pollen and drink nectar. Uh, honey bees, of course, are used. They're kind of like more like livestock. They're used for creating, you know, making honey and things like that, pollinating plants. But most, many of the bees out there are native solitary bees that don't make hives. They don't. They're not aggressive. They make nest in a big open spot where lots of them will be there. But they're not. It's like an apartment complex. It's not like everybody's like in the same family. They're all kind of doing their own thing, but it's just a place where they all like to be. Okay, um, good, we'll get through this. Okay, <laughs> Coleoptera, the beetles. So one of my favorite groups, huge group. Anybody know how many species there are known in the world? You know, guess, anybody want to take a guess? How many? 80,000? No, there's some, some families that have 60,000. Weevils, for instance, there are 60,000 weevil species in the world. So there are about 350,000 species of beetles in the world known, and there's probably many, many more. So basically a quarter of all animal or organisms on Earth are beetles. So if you pick out a bag, every fourth one is going to be a beetle. So really crazy, really diverse. Um, so some, there could be a lot of pests too. So scarabs and white, white grubs, uh, the most famous one around here probably being the Japanese beetle. Um, but uh, it's a really interesting group. They, they have these special antennae where the tip of it, the, the club, actually opens up like fingers. So that's how you actually ID the family. Uh, they can open and close. I'll show you that in a second. I think I have, yeah. Um, so Japanese beetles, some of them, the larvae are pests on turf. They'll feed on roots. Uh, others, the adults are pests. They feed on foliage or fruit or things like that. And then some are just kind of beneficial. In fact, things like dung beetles are scarabs and they're very beneficial. Yeah, yeah, you're like, yeah, you love dung beetles. Yeah, I know. Dung beetles are great. I, used to, I studied them for my master's here. And uh, they're really cool. Obviously, they get rid of all that dung. They, refer, they fertilize the soil, things like that. Um, but the larvae are these C-shaped grubs. So if you're digging, you're like pulling up rocks or digging in the garden, you often find these. For the most part, if you find them, don't freak out. It doesn't mean that you've got a mass infestation. In fact, they're common in a lot of grasses and lawns and things like that. But they're at low numbers or numbers enough that the grass is fine. But oftentimes they also feed on decaying organic matter or in rotting wood. So really, you would have to know that there's a patch there that's really hyper dense with all these pests. You'll see dead grass. If you pull it up, you'll find those larvae. Then you have to know you have an issue. But typically they're there, but not a huge issue. Uh, but you'll often see a lot of different types coming to light in the spring. If you leave the lights on, you'll get all these May beetles. Um, this is a rice beetle, and this is a mass chafer. Um, and it's hard to see here, but you can see those antennae. See how they're, they're kind of these finger-like openings. They've kind of got these plates. So that's how you identify scarab beetles. And of course, the larvae, again, are C-shaped, uh, grub-like insects that live in the soil or in rotten wood. Now, flea, leaf and flea beetles are a hugely diverse family called the Chrysomelidae. Um, really diverse in size and color. In fact, so you get these are both leaf beetles, but they look completely different. Um, they have these straight antennae that are not, they're about the third, the three quarters, half or three quarters of the length of the body, not super long. The tarsi, which are these little leg segments, have four segments. The larvae are caterpillar or worm-like, so some are actually on plants, many are in the soil and around roots. And uh, how many of you have ever heard of a corn rootworm or a rootworm? So they call them that because they're long looking, but they're actually larval beetles. Uh, most, almost all are plant feeders, so this is why they become important. Adults and or larvae may be primary pests. They can defoliate, skeletonize plants, and some, like the striped cucumber beetle, with, uh, they can transmit bacterial will to cucumbers and cucurbits and things like that. So they can be really important. I can't go over every species that's around, but know that there's a huge diversity of them. Uh, this one actually pretends to be caterpillar poop, which does it tucks its legs and head in, and it looks like caterpillar poop. Uh, the larvae of these are really cool too because they carry a case around them like bagworms almost, but it's made out of fecal matter, so they just walk around and eat plants. This is a really famous one, of course. This is anybody know what that is? What's that? Ashley, Ashley, that's, <laughs> that's the Colorado potato beetle. It's huge. It's uh, really well known because it can be resistant to a lot of pesticides. 
and it was on native hosts in, in the western part of the U.S. And then when we started planting potatoes and other solanaceous hosts, like they go off to eggplant and potatoes, they started going crazy and eating them and stuff. Uh, then you have leaf miner ones. You have these flea beetles that have these large hind legs that can jump. Uh, this is a red-headed flea beetle, which just feeds on all over this. This is one that's feeding on uh, rosemary, but they feed on a lot of uh, uh, plants in nurseries. When they're out, when they're in the yards, they're typically not a huge issue, but they can be there. Uh, this is an oak beetle, oak leaf beetle. This one's the imported willow leaf beetle, and you can see the larvae look like little caterpillars uh, and skeletonize, and then the adults feed on the willows also. So huge group, I can you know list off. Again, you can have all semester for just beetles and leaf beetles and stuff. Okay, now longhorn beetles are a closer related group, but they're very different in their biology. So they have do have a very long antennae, typically more than half, and, and many times, many times the length of the body. Um, they also have these, and the eyes are kidney shaped because the antennae usually kind of push into where the eye is. So they kind of have they're not circles. That's actually different than if you look at the leaf beetles have nice circle eyes. Um, now the larvae are grub-like, but live typically in plants in wood. Um, now. All our plant feeders, most larvae bore in dead or dying trees. Some do attack herbaceous plants or girdle limbs. Um, but really, people get freaked out. They see a plant dying, a tree dying. They pull off the bark or they break open a, a, stem, a twig and they find these grubs in them. And they say, oh, this thing killed my tree. Or they see holes in it, this thing killed my tree. There are very few, there are really almost no species that uh, will attack healthy trees and plants and kill them. Uh, Asian longhorn beetle is the one exception. It's been now established in Charleston, South Carolina. Who knows if we'll get it? It's a, I can tell you all about that one. That's an exotic one. It will attack healthy trees, especially maples. But most of these, if you see them, are going to be secondary. It's a sign that there's something wrong with the tree because that attracts these beetles that want to eat them, the wounded trees. It's like a lot of these things I'm going to be discussing are like the lion attacking the the older or sick or whatever, young, like the one that's the most susceptible. Uh, and they need that wood, they're going to eat that wood specifically, they actually feed on the wood. Um, one of the ones that does attack them, and it's funny because this, this just goes to show you, a couple of these beetles will attack healthy plants, but they need to girdle it first. So they need to actually kill the plant to, to actually invade it. So this is one, this is the azalea stem borer. I've never seen one of these myself, but they Basically, if you see different canes or different stems of the azalea dying, what they'll do is they'll chew, they'll chew a little girdle around it, and then they'll lay eggs above that because basically they're cutting off the, the plant from there. It'll kill everything above it, and that'll be a nice home then for the larvae. It won't like the fresh plant material. There's also uh, twig girdles, which again I've never seen. It create perfect girdles. Create perfect. It looks like somebody took a knife and just carved right around a twig on a, a deciduous plant, a tree. And those then fall off, they've laid the eggs in there, and they fall to the ground, so they make their own dead plant material. Uh, but again, that won't hurt the tree because you're only basically clipping off little bits and pieces. Um, got a few more beetles, maybe we'll finish that and then we'll take a break. So, okay, weevils. I know there's a lot of stuff, but uh, yeah, again, I'll, I'll share this stuff so you can see. Weevils, huge group, second largest family of beetles, 60,000 species in the world. Extremely diverse in size, color, and shape. Um, most of the long mouth part, the long rostrum, and the mouth parts are actually at the tip. This is a broad nosed weevil. This is actually a banded Japanese weevil, which is a really common pest of uh, foliage on plants. Uh, they'll chew notches on the edge of the leaves. Uh, they won't usually chew in the center. Uh, and this actually, this species is only females here in the US. So they reproduce very easily. They can just lay eggs and have more of them. Uh, the antennae are elbowed. So they have this really nice long segment and then all these other segments there, so it does look like kind of on an elbow. Um, larvae are grub-like and lack legs, uh, so they don't have any legs at all. Um, almost all are plant feeders, and the adults and or larvae do the damage to the plants. And some are stored product pests, so you'll get pantry pests, there's, uh, there's granary weevils that will uh, live in seeds and things like that. Um, and. Uh, you know, I'm aware that this is not a very common one, something actually a long time ago asked me to put it in here, but this, uh, this one just bored under the bark of, uh, of uh, Arbor Vitae. And you can see the larvae are grub-like, but they have no legs at all. So they have a nice distinct head, no legs at all. 
Uh, you'll see some of them live on foliage, like uh, vegetable weevils. They look green, or, or alfalfa weevils will look like legless caterpillars. But most of them are going to be either under bark or un in plants or in the soil. Uh, so you won't often see the larvae of weevils. But again, the, that rostrum and the elbowed antennae are characteristic of the adults. Now, a really special group of weevils are the bark and ambrosia beetles. And this is one that you're really definitely going to need to know because you will see them out there. So these are, they don't have a rostrum, they don't have that long nose because they live under in tunnels and under bark as adults, so they, that would get in the way, obviously. So they don't, they, actually for a long time, they were treated as a different group, but the larvae are very similar. Now, um, the eyes are flat and kidney shaped. They've got a clubbed antenna. Um, and what they do is they either feed under the bark, the larvae will go right under the bark, up and down the tree, or if you're an ambrosia beetle like these, what they do is they find a plant, a woody plant, and they bore right in, and they push out the frass and the saw and the sawdust as this what they call a sawdust toothpick, a frass toothpick. Huh. And so they can, you can get washed away in wind or rain. But if you see these coming out of plant, you know you have ambrosia beetles. And bark beetles feed on the plant itself. Ambrosia beetles, what they do is they bore into the plant, but they actually bring with them pockets of fungal spores, and they grow. They they're actually gardeners. So I don't know if you appreciate that. But they do garden their own fungus. They, they need a plant that's actually dead or dying, typically. So they'll bore into the plant. The plant that can't, doesn't have defenses against this garden. And then it can uh, kind of seed the inside of the tunnel with a fungus that will then grow out and the larvae feed on that fungus only. So there are a few species around. The red bay ambrosia beetle that attacks Loraceae is a primary pest. They will attack healthy ones. They bring a fungus that actually clogs the vascular system and causes them to wilt and causes laurel wilt. That is a really serious pest. We are, it's spreading around the southeast. We, you know, we, we know about it and we're worried about things like sassafras and spice bush and stuff like that, the native Floraceans. Uh, it does affect the avocados as well. So, but, um, but many times if you see this going on, you know that there's some issue with your plant otherwise because the plants are basically screaming out with chemicals. They may look green still, but if you see these beetles attacking, there's a good, that's a good sign that there's something wrong with the plant otherwise. Something wrong with its roots. I've seen a fig, we have a fig tree on campus that has multiple stems, and one stem had all these beetles attacking it, and a stem right next to it on the same plant had no beetles attacking it. That's because the stem that the beetles were attacking had frost damage, so all the bark was split and was dead. And so they love that dead stuff. They don't like the healthy stuff. They've even done experiments where they put the beetles up neck, like put them in a box, neck wrapped around the, wrapped around the tree. And a healthy tree, they will, they'll just avoid it. They don't care. So they can smell these things that you can't. So they're also a good kind of indicator that you have an unhealthy plant. So they can actually be kind of beneficial in that way. But they're basically just decomposers. They, they use these things, except for a few species. And I think one more. One, one or two more. So pine beetles are a specific type of bark beetle. I will tell you, the outbreaks of pine beetles are very rare and almost non-existent around here. So if you see a pine that's dying, it has holes in it, a lot of people will ask you if it's pine beetles. It's almost certainly not the case around here. When pine beetles attack, it's one of the few species that will attack healthy trees. What they do is they bore into the healthy trees, and because of all that resin the pines produce, that's a, a resin that's actually special to pines because they want to, that's a, an insect control. What they do is they push that resin, the resin pushes the insect out, but so many of these will attack the plant that it overwhelms it and it runs out of resin. So if you see these little popcorn resin balls on the outside, that means it was healthy when it was attacked. It produced those to help protect it, and that's a sign that you've got pine bark beetles. Otherwise, if you just see dry holes, it's almost certainly the pine is declining some other way. They're longhorn beetles, other beetles in um, I think I only have, yeah, I only have a couple more. So just ladybugs. So ladybugs are a really cool group. How many of you know ladybugs? Uh, yeah, everybody knows ladybugs. Um, they, they do come in other colors though, other than black with red spots. They have, or red with black spots. They have ones that are black with red spots. This is a really pretty one with blue eyes. Uh, this is the Dahlia beetle. Uh, what's, it, what's it eating? Do I know? That's a big good, that'd be a good guess. It is uh, the cottony cushion scale. So this was the, the beetle that was imported from Australia to, um, to kill cottony cushion scales. It's specific to them. Most ladybugs feed on 
aphids and soft-bodied insects. They're very voracious. They're really beneficial. Although uh, the Asian ladybug, the multicolored Asian ladybug, it can be a nuisance in homes in winters, and I've actually been bitten by them before. They don't feel good. Uh, there are a couple. I was on the, if you were on the PPP the other day. There's uh, squash beetles and Mexican bean beetles, which are the only a couple native uh, local ones that are plant feeders. But for the most part, ladybugs are insect feeders. Uh, some feeding specifically on scales, other on aphids and white flies. Um, and the larvae, though, come in all different forms. So this is Harmonia. This is the Asian ladybug. They have very large, showy, black and orange ones. But some of them actually look like mealy bugs. They create wax as well. Uh, and so if you see a very mobile thing, but it's around and it looks like it's munching on or around all these aphids and things like that, it's probably a ladybug larva. And also if you were to flip it over, you'd see very distinct legs. You'd see a head that doesn't have sucking mouth parts and stuff. Uh, but they are, you know, they, they feed on these little aphids. And some of them are very tiny, these ladybugs. You can see these are baby aphids. And you know how big a regular aphid is. Think about a baby aphid and think about how tiny these ladybug larvae are. So they're not all these big showy ones. Some of them are smaller black ones. Some of them are really tiny, just all black. So they're a hugely diverse group, really, really cool. Okay, now we can take a break, <laughs> I think, right?